at Exodus 14, verses 1 through 31, that is what I want to talk to you about, is the design in difficulty. The design in difficulty. Looking at the crossing of the Red Sea. So what is God's design in difficulty? There are many things that we could say about God's design in difficulty. And many things to be said outside of this passage of Scripture. But I think from this passage of Scripture, there are at least three observations that we can make about God's design in difficulty. Don't want you to get caught off guard. Don't want any of us to get caught off guard when we are going through times of difficulty and and think that they're happenstance or to think that that difficulty is, is just the confluence of, of certain circumstances in our lives that is accidental. It is not accidental at all. Every difficulty, every measure of difficulty, just as every blessing, every measure of difficulty comes as the purpose and the design of God. And there are things that God is doing. There are things that God is accomplishing through difficulty. And we have the opportunity, the blessed opportunity to be able to look back in history and see how the Lord uh, ordained and designed difficulty for the people, the children of Israel, so that we could learn from that so that we could learn from that and we could make these observations and be a little better prepared for these times of suffering, trial, temptation, difficulty. So let's look at this passage with the understanding in mind that the Lord has brought Israel out of Egypt. They have observed the Passover meal. They have observed the Lord's Passover where the angel of death passed over the homes of those whose doors had been uh, covered in the blood of that sacrificial lamb. But the Lord did not pass over in mercy the homes of the Egyptians who were not covered by blood. No, the Lord killed the firstborn son of every home and even the firstborn of all the livestock. And so Egypt said in unison, leave. Get out. Pharaoh finally relented and he said, get out and leave. And so all of Israel, they asked of their neighbors for possessions and the Lord gave them great favor. And the Lord gave them great wealth and sent them out. And they hurried their way out of Egypt and they're leaving and they're going to the north. They're going by the way of the sea to the land of promise, to the land of Canaan, as you would know it, the land of Israel. And they're hugging the sea, and they're going to take the easy route, the direct route. And then the Lord puts a quick stop to that. The Lord is not going to let them take the easy, direct route. And what we saw the last time we were in Exodus, when we looked at Exodus 13, is that the leadership of the Lord is perfectly wise. Perfectly wise. The path that the Lord ordains is the right path. It's the best path. And in fact, we know that it's always His path. He is on that path. Not only is the leadership of the Lord perfectly wise, it is also permanently faithful. It's permanently faithful. It's important for us to understand that because when we look at the life of Israel, the people of Israel, we come to understand that the the direct path is not always the best path. The direct path to glory is not always the best path. We also come to understand that the difficult path is not always unwise. The difficult thing, the difficult way, the difficult path is not always unwise. We ought not measure the wisdom of things by their ease. Because in the paradigm of God's sovereignty, it is often the opposite of that. So, the Lord is going to design a very difficult path for Israel. Just as the Lord has designed difficult paths for each of us. He has designed difficult paths, discipline for each of us, not out of hatred, but out of love. The Lord disciplines us as a father, the son of his love. And so the Lord has ordained difficult paths 
for each of us. There's some truths that we need to take home and we need to firmly root those in our heart. I'm going to summarize the sermon in this way and you'll see these three observations laden here in this summary statement. You might want to write this down. The Lord designs difficulty in our lives to demonstrate His power, secure a holy fear, and fortify us in faith. The Lord designs difficulty in our lives to demonstrate His power, secure a holy fear, and fortify us in faith. I want to look at this passage in two sections. Verses 1 through 18, and then verse 19 through 31. And after we've looked at everything, and we'll walk through it relatively quickly, because I want you to get the big picture. I want you to see the big picture of the situation, and then the salvation unfold. And after we've walked through that passage, we're going to draw back, and we're going to draw out three observations. Three observations about God's design and difficulty. When we look at verses 1 through 18, we see the Lord's design of a difficult situation. The Lord's purposeful design of a difficult situation. Verses 1 through 18 lay out for us all of the circumstances and how the Lord designed every one of those circumstances and did so not just to, not just to create a difficult situation, but I'll show you, to actually design an impossible scenario. An impossible scenario. So that's what we see in verses 1 through 18 is the Lord's design of a difficult situation. Then in verse 19 through 31, we see the Lord's demonstration of salvation. The Lord's demonstration of salvation. So He puts all of the circumstances together in such a way that it is impossible to overcome. And then the Lord shows that He does in fact do the impossible. And the circumstances that we would estimate as impossible with no path forward is in fact the exact situation that the Lord has designed for His own glory and for the good of His people. And if we do truly believe and know that the Lord is unchanging, that He has never changed, then we would assume rightly that the Lord is still in the business of ordaining difficult and impossible situations for His glory and for our good. You see, when the Lord directs all of the aspects of our lives and creates these circumstances of impossibility, be ready to observe how the Lord makes a path, how the Lord makes a way when there is no way. Here's the trick of faith. The trick of faith is to understand that the Lord oftentimes does not reveal that path until the very end, until you're ready to snap, until you're ready to give up. And then he reveals the path forward. And most of the time, Brother Carlton, we end up having to ask God for forgiveness because we didn't trust that he had a path ordained. We just, we just figured based on our reasoning and our evaluation of the circumstances and situation, there is no path forward. Not even with God. So the trick of faith is to never doubt. Never doubt the design and the wisdom and the faithfulness of God. Because there's some things that He is not going to reveal to you until you go through these kinds of situations. So let's go ahead to observe them. By the Lord's grace, observe them in the life of the people of Israel says in chapter 14, again, we'll look at verses 1 through 18 together. The Lord's design of a difficult situation. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back. That doesn't make sense. Tell them to turn back and encamp in front of 
Pi-Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. A lot of places that even if I tried to explain in detail where they are, most of us would not know exactly where it is. The exact location that this took place is in fact not even known with certainty. This is the northern part of Egypt, the northern part of Africa, somewhere between that northern part and Israel. There in the wilderness, at the tip of the wilderness. In fact, Baal Zephon means Baal of the north. Baal of the north. Pi Hahiroth means mouth of the canals. Mouth of the canals. And Migdal means fort. Tower. So it seemed to describe the kind of place. This is a watery place. It's the mouth of canals. This is where these canals are, are dumping into the Red Sea. All this water is coming in. This is a dangerous place. This is also a place of military significance. There's a fort there. There's a tower there. There's some sort of militaristic establishment there because this would have been a pass-through. This would have been a place fortuitous for battle because you have people trapped. They have to go a certain way. And it's right there in the north on the way for Israel. And the Lord says, I know you're going by the way of the sea and you're going to the land of Canaan, Moses. Stop everyone. Turn around and go back to this impassable location. Go back to this impassable location. Four, verse three. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. That is aimlessly moving in the land. The wilderness has shut them in or imprisoned them. The wilderness has imprisoned them. These slaves are wandering about aimlessly. They can't make their way through the wilderness. They have gotten turned around every which way, and now they are stuck in an impossible location. The circumstances are favorable to go and get what we lost. This is what Pharaoh is going to think, the Lord says. The wilderness has shut them in, verse 4. Not only is Pharaoh going to think it, Pharaoh is going to be forced to act on it. He says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Three times in this passage, the word hazak is used to harden, to fortify, to make it impenetrable. To make it impenetrable. There will be no reason, no grace, no mercy spoken to the heart of Pharaoh. Why? Because the Lord will fix it so. The Lord is fixing Pharaoh's heart where this is exactly what he is doing. He will set up the circumstances where they seem reasonable to Pharaoh to go, and the Lord will harden Pharaoh's heart to do nothing but pursue Israel and pursue them not for health, but to pursue them with his army. This is not the first time in the book of Exodus we have seen the Lord exercise his sovereign providential will over the heart of Pharaoh. In fact, the Lord foretold it. He told Moses he was going to do this before he ever sent Moses back into the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, it says this, The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. Why? Do all the miracles I've put in your power. Is that going to con convince Pharaoh? No. He says, But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Why does the Lord harden Pharaoh's heart? So that he can multiply his wonders in Egypt. So that the Egyptians know the glory of God in wrath, and that the Israelites know the glory of God in salvation. The Lord has good reason, glorious reason, for hardening Pharaoh's heart. In fact, nine times in the book of Exodus, the Lord says, I will harden 
Pharaoh's heart. Seven times the book of Exodus records the, that Pharaoh hardened his heart as the Lord said. So which is it? Did the Lord harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? Yes. Yes. Pharaoh hardened his heart and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But what we see from these passages is not, is not that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart as a response to the wayward direction of Pharaoh's will. We see is that the Lord did not harden Pharaoh's heart as a response, but rather that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was God's purpose. This was not a reaction, and this was not a response to Pharaoh's will. Pharaoh's will was a response to the Lord's will. And so the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart, and this is why. It says in Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. The Lord is interested in every person, in every person in all of creation knowing him glorifying his name not all glorify the name of the lord in salvation all glorify the name of the lord some in wrath some in salvation but nevertheless all glorify the name of the lord the book of proverbs chapter 16 verse 4 says this even the lord has made everything for its purpose even the wicked for the day of trouble this would be a day of trouble. This will be a day of trouble for Egypt. Though by every human calculation, this is a horrible day of trouble for Israel. The Lord will flip, flip the script because the Lord is going to mix in a, a variable here that no man would have ever considered. It would have never entered into the mind of man. In fact, it would be unimaginable that the Lord would do this so that you shall know that I am the Lord. That I am the Lord. You remember that name, the Lord. We've read it in Exodus chapter 3. We've read it many times on Sunday mornings as we look at the Gospel of John. The Lord tells Moses in Exodus chapter 3, He says, tell the people of Israel, I am has sent you. I am the Lord. When the Lord speaks of himself in this way, he is using this eternal present tense to be verb to describe himself. Not I was, I am, and I will be. But the Lord speaks of himself always in the present tense. I am. It speaks of it to his unchanging nature. Moreover, it speaks to his eternal nature. He is in the eternal present tense. It speaks to his self-sufficiency. The Lord exists not by means of creation. All of creation exists by means of the Lord's upholding power. The Lord is self-sufficient. And not only that, if the Lord has the power to maintain his own person and life unchanging for all eternity, the only other fitting definition is to describe the Lord as omnipotent, to be all-powerful. So the Lord says, so you shall know that I am the Lord, omnipotent, self-sufficient, eternal. This is what the Lord is interested in demonstrating to Egypt, to Israel, and even to the drowning army of Pharaoh. Why? Because the Lord is interested in all the world knowing his glory. Let me just tell you, Pharaoh is begging for this. Pharaoh is begging to know the Lord. He says in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh is getting a crash course in the knowledge of the holy in knowing who God is, in knowing who the omnipotent God is. God is all-powerful, not Egypt and not Pharaoh and not the false gods of Egypt. But it gets even better here. 
The Lord has secured that Pharaoh is going to pursue Israel and pursue them, in fact, in an impassable location. Israel is going to be stuck. They cannot move out of this place. And, and they even appear as, a, as an animal that's lost in a maze, just running around in circles. It says in verse 5, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him. Now, what is a chariot? A chariot is a vehicle of war. It is a vehicle of war. And if you were to think back as far as much we know about ancient warfare, the chariot was the most powerful weapon of warfare in the world. The most powerful weapon of warfare in the world. This could defeat armies. It could surely defeat an army of freed slaves who have made bricks all their life and have no experience with a sword. None at all. And here is Pharaoh taking the, the best, most lethal weapons of warfare to the most impassable location in all of the wilderness against a most helpless of all people on the earth. It's even better. It says, so he made, verse 6, ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. So this is not just soldiers. These are the elite soldiers on the elite vehicles of warfare and they kind of just quit counting. The 600 best chariots and horsemen and all the other chariots. It's as if Pharaoh walks through the stables and says, take all my best chariots. And then he looks around and says, just get all those ready too. Get everybody together. We will not fail. Pharaoh is going to march out an invincible army. Compared to Israel, this is an invincible enemy. 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. Verse 8, And the Lord hardened, made it impenetrable. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamped by the sea at Pi Hahiroth, in front of Baal Zephon, mouth of the canals, Baal of the north, right here at this impassable, horrible, horrible, horrible location for the people of Israel. And what's the attitude of Israel as they go out of Egypt? Look back again at verse 8. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. That word there for defiantly is actually two words in Hebrew. It actually means with raised fist. With raised fist. Almost always when you see that phrase used in Hebrew, it is speaking of haughty, arrogant behavior. It is speaking of somebody who believes themselves to be superior and better than. So when this group of freed slaves is leaving out of Egypt, what is their heart? Is their heart, thank you, God. I am lowly and you've saved me. Their heart is, we're so much better than you. We deserve this. We deserve this. You give us what we deserve. And here we go, and they're all walking out, gloating. And they're walking through the wilderness, and they're gloating. And just a chapter before, 
Uh, unbeknownst to Israel, the Lord says, look, I can't even take them by the way of the sea because if they go to the land of Canaan right now and they face battle, they're all going to quit because they're a bunch of freed slaves. And they're free, but they're not hardened warriors. They can't handle it. Ironically enough, the Lord takes them to a battle zone. He takes them to a battle zone where, I'll tell you, they don't have the opportunity to go backwards. They're going to be stuck. Whereas they would have run from war at the border of Israel, they're going to be in a battle they can't run from. So the Lord's going to put them in a situation he already said, they will fail. There is no doubt they will absolutely fail. And yet, their attitude is defiant. Their attitude is of superiority. I am better than. Friend, I hope that none of us ever have that kind of attitude. That the Lord has saved us because there's something within us deserving of that salvation. That we would say the Lord saved me because I'm better than. When in fact the Bible tells us that the Lord saved us because we were the worst. Because the Lord has actually chosen the least of all to show grace and to show glory. We're not, we're not better than anyone. Especially not better than other people. Israel would struggle with this. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's some warnings given. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 to Israel says, And you shall remember the whole way. The whole journey that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that He might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. So why did the Lord lead Israel through the wilderness for 40 years rather than taking them on a direct path? Because they were too arrogant to go into the promised land. And the Lord was going to take them into the wilderness to do some serious humbling. Fair warning, When we walk in pride and we walk in arrogance and we walk in superiority, the Lord is often determined, and I'll say even always determined, for His children to be humbled in the wilderness. Better to be humble and get to walk the the narrow path, the, the little easier path, than to be haughty and superior and be humbled in the wilderness. Moreover, the Lord said uh, even more in Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 5, Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them, the enemies, out of Canaan, has thrust them out before you. Don't say in your heart, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess the land, whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. And that He may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Why is the Lord? Why is the Lord casting out these nations out of Canaan? Not because Israel deserves it. It's because those nations don't deserve it. So the Lord is punishing those nations. And it just so happens that the Lord had made a promise to Israel's ancestors to give them that land. But here they are, marching through the wilderness, now in circles. And they got their fists raised to the sky. We're better than everybody. When really, they're not even good enough to go straight to the border. They can't handle it. They can't handle it. And you'll see their attitude change here in just a, a few moments. Verse 10, it's shocking how quickly, how quickly their, their, their air of superiority shifts. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel, they cried out, and that verb for cried out includes within it this, this desperation, this screaming. I thought they were better. I thought they were superior, fists in the air. And here they are, crying out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die In the wilderness, you talk about a dynamic attitude shift. 
They're not better than anyone, are they? Now they realize we are dead. We were superior two verses ago, but now we're as good as dead. And it would have been better, can you imagine the mentality? It would have been better, morally superior, to have remained slaves in Egypt than to come out here where we are because we are as good as dead men. A dramatic shift. The Lord has a way of quickly, quickly humbling us. So he puts them in an impossible situation. So, the Lord tells them. In fact, Moses, the Lord's servant, says in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not and stand firm. Something about your attitude that needs to change. Fear not and stand firm. And see there's something about your perspective that needs to change. And see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. In fact, when you read the end of verse 13, which you don't see in your English translation, when it says, you shall never see again, Again, I don't know why the ESV leaves this untranslated, but it actually says, Ad Olam, Ad Olam. And you will never see them again, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of time, unto eternity. You just need to fear not, stand firm, and watch. See the salvation. The word for salvation is actually the word Yeshua. See the, see the Jesus that the Lord is going to work for you. See the salvation the Lord will work for you. The Lord will fight for you, verse 14, and you have only to be silent. That's a comforting verse. I've taken great comfort in that verse. I remember a dear friend of mine giving that verse to me by way of encouragement number of years ago that got me through a very difficult time where I thought that it was an impossible situation when in fact the Lord made a path where I would have never imagined a path. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Verse 15, why, why are you doing this? Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. To go forward where? There's a sea there. Tell the people of Israel to go forward into the sea. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Cut it open. That word for divide, it means to take a sharp instrument and cut it open. Divide it. That the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them and I will get glory. I will make my name renowned over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So what has the Lord done in verses 1 through 18? The Lord has designed a difficult, impossible situation. Here's Pharaoh with all of the best of his army, all the best of his chariots, and everyone else, and they are coming directly at, dust behind them, flying at the children of Israel who are haplessly, helplessly, and hopelessly right there on the northern part, right by the sea, and they have no choice. And they're crying to the Lord, we're dead. And Moses is told, why are you talking to me? Tell the people to go forward. Tell the people to walk into the sea. This is impossible. This is an impossible situation the Lord has designed. We'll come back and make some observations. Let's look at verses 19 through 31. The Lord's designed a difficult situation. Now the Lord's going to demonstrate salvation. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. 
And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Now, when you see the angel of God, I really have no other way of interpreting this according to the book of Exodus than this being a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. This is the way that I I would have to interpret this. When I look back at Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, This is the first time in the book of Exodus I see this name, the angel of God, used. And let's see what is said there in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 through 6. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, that is to Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And let let me just point you to this. See how the angel of the Lord speaks. He doesn't speak about the Lord. He speaks as the Lord. He looked, and behold, Moses did. The bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, so who saw? The Lord. God called to him out of the bush. So the angel of the Lord is God. God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am. Who said I am? The angel. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. God the Father is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. If Moses is here looking at God, the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, same person, who is he looking at? He's not looking at the Father. He's not looking at the Holy Spirit. He's looking at Jesus. He's looking at the pre-incarnate Christ who has yet to receive the name Jesus. Here he is the messenger of the Lord, God's powerful agent. Ring a bell now. And the word became flesh. God's powerful agent of creation, of work, his message, his messenger. So who is it that is going before Israel in the wilderness, in this pillar of fire? It's Jesus. Jesus is there. Then the angel of God, verse 19, look at it again. Then the angel of God, Jesus, who was going before the hosts of Israel, he's walking before them, this pillar of fire, he moved and went behind them. He had been leading them, and then he moves behind them. And the pillar of cloud, which led them by day, moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all the night. In Exodus 13, we read that this was the way, the manner in which the Lord was leading Israel throughout the wilderness. He was leading them by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire in the night. Now we come to understand that the pillar of fire was the angel of the Lord, the angel of God. This is Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, leading Israel through the wilderness. And now in this special, this special instance of deliverance, they're not just seeing the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Now they're seeing both. And they are side by side all night, not touching one another but lighting up everything. And where did they move? They moved from before Israel, leading them forward, to being behind Israel. Great significance there. Verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. 
And note this, verse 24, and in the morning watch, that is, in this shift, in the morning shift, in the time in which the morning sentry would be looking over the wall to see if an army is coming, who is taking up the morning watch? Who is covering the rear flank? Who is on the the front line of the battle? And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging the chariot wheels, literally making their wheels come off as they're there in the midst, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea. Again, what time of day is it? Morning watch. It's the morning watch. And children of Israel are moving to the east. The sun is rising. Which means they can what? They can see. All of the rest is taking place at night under this pillar of cloud and of fire. Now everyone can see very clearly across the whole dry seabed with these giant walls of water to either side. And there's Pharaoh, his chariots, his choice horsemen and men. And there they are, slogging around in the dirt that is becoming muddy. They can't move. They're in a panic. And they are, yes indeed, with some of their last dying breaths, they are giving glory to God. The Lord fights for them. The Lord said to Moses, verse 26, Stretch out your hand of the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved. Yeshua. Thus the Lord Jesus Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw, how did they see? By the light of the day. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. This inconquerable, invincible enemy. Israel saw the great power. That is, they saw the powerful hand that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. What a stark change of heart. There may people who, who were going out defiantly, arrogantly, in this haughty air of superiority. They fear the Egyptians. They have no choice. They walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. They get to the other end. The waters crash down. They turn around in amazement. And all of their enemies are dead, floating on the shore. And their reaction is to fear the Lord and say, Okay, God, I believe you now. I believe you. I trust you. That word for believe in Hebrew actually means to to put on. I, I wear you. I believe in you so much that I'll clothe myself in this trust, in this faith. And we're not done. Let's make some observations here. Three observations of God's design and difficulty. Observation number one. The Lord designs difficulty to demonstrate his power towards his people. The Lord designs difficulty to demonstrate His power towards His people. In other words, 
Sometimes the Lord turns off the lights so that we see who the light is. Sometimes the Lord puts us in a dark place where we've got nowhere else to look but Him. Sometimes God deprives us from whatever we thought was giving us strength. From whatever we thought was giving us strength. He deprives us of that so that we know where our power actually comes from. Indeed, it's not our power at all. It's the strength that the Lord provides. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, he gave up. He gave up and he just celebrated that. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10. Paul says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the re- conceited. Fist held high. So could you keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations? A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Who gave him that? The Lord did. Why? To keep him from becoming haughty, fist raised. To keep me from becoming conceited, he says. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, my power is made perfect in weakness. So that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, or in other words, difficult, impossible situations. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the Lord sometimes, many times, especially when we're arrogant, the Lord will deprive us of what we think strengthens us so that He can show us the true source of strength to demonstrate His power towards His people. This is what the Lord did to Israel. You saw that there in verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. Well, Lord, how do we know it'll be you who fights for us? Because I'm going to make you walk through this and turn around and stand still and shut up. And you're going to watch me handle the whole scenario. You're going to watch me handle the whole situation. But God, I like to have my hands in everything. God, I like to, God, give me a sword. Lord, you know I can fight. You know I'll bow up against the best of them, Lord. I will go down dying. And the Lord says, be quiet. Don't say another word. You go over there and stand across the finish line. And I'll run the rest of the race for you. And you watch. And then when you get handed the medal, you get on your knees and give it up in glory. And say the power came from God. God's not interested in us being glorified in our own self. God is interested in us giving him glory. Observation number two. The Lord designs difficulty to secure his people in holy fear. The Lord designs difficulty to secure his people. That means we are secure. We are safe when we fear the Lord. We are not safe when we fear men. We are not safe when we fear the opinions of others. We are safe when we fear God. That is when we are safe. That is when we are secure. And the Lord will design scenarios. He will design scenarios to secure you and I in a holy fear. We are scared out of our minds. And the Lord comes through and turns around and says, why are you crying out to me? Why are you you doubting? The Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again, even unto eternity. This problem that you think is insurmountable and that you are terrified of, this right thing that you need to do, that you are terrified of, you just do it. You fear me and do it. These are the kinds of situations that the Lord designs for us. I'll take you back to the text now. Look at verse... 
13. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. Two of those three address one thing, and then one of the three addresses another. The first address that the Lord gives here in this little statement in verse 13 addresses the attitude of Israel. The attitude of Israel. What is their attitude? Well, it's right there. He says, fear not, stand firm. Their attitude right now is that they are fearful and they are quaking in their sandals. Right? They're not standing firm. They are full of fear. And the Lord says, stop it. You need to change your attitude. You need to change the way that you look at these circumstances. You see Pharaoh, you see an impossible situation, you see this impassable sea, and you are afraid, and you need to take some heart, put fear away, and you need to stand firm. The Lord first addresses their attitude. Notice that in verse 13, what is prohibited? What is prohibited is the fear of man. But when you look at verse 31, in verse 13, fear is mocked. Fear not. Stand firm. In verse 31, do you see any corrective terms? In verse 31, it just says, and so Israel feared the Lord. There is no corrective issued. There is no prohibition issue at all. So I thought fear was bad. Fear is prohibited in one sense, and yet it's set up as the example in another sense. Fear is a failure. Fear is always a failure when the object of our fear is someone or something other than the Lord. Fear is always a failure when the object of that fear is someone or something other than the Lord. So the Lord says, fear not, stand firm. He addresses their attitude. You know, the next thing the Lord addresses in verse 13 is not their attitude, it's their attention. He addresses their attention, their perspective. Look at what he does. Fear not, stand firm, and see, see the salvation of the Lord. So think with me geographically, perspective-wise. Israel has been led through the wilderness to this point, pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day, always going before them, leading them to the place to go. They get to the edge of the sea, and they're looking and following the Lord, and they stop at the edge of the sea. And then they hear a rumbling in the back. And they've been looking forward at the Lord. They hear rumbling in the back. And they turn around and look, and what's behind them? What's behind them is Pharaoh. What's behind them is their problem. And they turn around and they look at the problem. And they begin to scream. They begin to yell. They begin to fear because they're looking at their enemy. And they are not looking at their Lord. They are dominated. They are lorded over by a tyrannical master. The fear of man. The fear of death. They are not looking at the Lord anymore. They're looking, they're looking at their enemy. Mind you, look back down at your text and you'll have great comfort here. Look at what the Lord does. Again, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud go before, right? Always. Look back at the text, verse 19. Then the angel of God, who was going, was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. They are in a difficult yet even impossible situation. You have an impassable sea before them. You have an invincible army behind them. They have nowhere to go. They see the impassable sea and they see the Lord and they don't care. They turn around and they're overcome by fear because of the enemy that's actually coming from behind them. And so what does the Lord do? The Lord moves from leading before them and he moves behind them. 
Oh, and we would, we would really easily jump to the most basic conclusion here and say, well, the Lord was just moving. He was just moving between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. This was a, this was a protective measure against the army so that the army can't go any further. Because, because Israel, what they really need, they need some time. They need some time to get through. And so the Lord is going gonna to set up a screen here. He's going to set up a screen and let them pass through safely. Surely that's all the Lord is doing. And that's not all the Lord is doing. The Lord was not simply moving between them and their enemy to buy them time. The Lord moved between them and their enemy so that their gaze was no longer on their enemy. Their gaze was on the Lord. They can't see Pharaoh now. They can't see his chariots now. They look behind and there's the Lord. And he says, you go that way. They turn around and you know what they see? A sea. And the Lord says, go forward. There's your path. Your path is through the waters. Through this agent of death, that's your path. You walk right through there. You see, the Lord was not merely guarding Israel from Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. The Lord was guarding Israel from fear of man. The Lord in the pillar of cloud and fire was a much more, much more forceful power. And the Lord said, fear me, and I'm saying walk. So what does Israel do? They, they walk. So the Lord is doing what for them? The Lord is securing his people in a holy fear. The Lord is perfectly fine, in fact, desirous of fear. But it's got to be a holy fear of Him. And when we fear God, we have no need to fear anyone else. Israel's problem was that they quit looking at their deliverer. And they started looking only at their enemy. Only at what was behind them. Only what the Lord had saved them from. And they weren't looking towards what the Lord was saving them to. And they weren't looking forward to who saved them in the first place. So the Lord rescued them from that. He secured them in a holy fear. He demonstrated his power towards his people. There's another observation to make, though. Number three, the Lord designs difficulty to fortify his people in faith. To fortify his people in faith. Impassable sea, invincible army, and the only way through was unimaginable. At this point, no one would have ever thought this. Whose mind would it have ever entered for people to walk through the sea on dry ground? It's unimaginable. Impassable sea, invincible army, unimaginable solution. And yet, what does the Lord do? The Lord designed a situation where there was no option but to trust Him. They can't go back towards Pharaoh. They couldn't get to Pharaoh if they tried. They can't walk through the pillar of fire and cloud. They have one way forward, and it's off the high dive. They're going to go through the Red Sea. No choice. No choice but to trust the Lord. Oh, we could celebrate Israel because in verse 31 it, says, 31, it says that they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Let me ask you, what choice did they have? Oh, friend, celebrate your faith, my faith, all we want. But we got to understand, what choice did we have? When the Lord says, it is wrath and hell, or it's glory and eternity in the kingdom of God. What choice is there? There is no choice. It is a glorious, determined outcome. I must choose the Lord when I see Him in all His beauty, in all His wonder, in all of His salvific provision. So the Lord designed a situation where they had to trust Him. They had to believe the impossible. Had to. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What was unseen? A road. A road in the water. 
Then again, it says in Hebrews eleven twenty, by faith, the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. So Israel was faithless in all of that. They were crying out to the Lord, we're going to die. It had been better to stay in Egypt, but they're celebrated for faith. Why? They had faith that big. They were in an impossible situation with no way forward but to go through, the Lord, go through the Lord's provision and to trust him. When we go through our difficult troubles, when we go through our trials, we have to understand that there's design in that. The Lord is securing our faith. He's demonstrating his power. He's giving us a holy fear. And here, Israel faced with this impossible situation. And they walk through water, which is what in the account? The water for Israel was the means of salvation. The water for Egypt was the agent of God's wrath. I've seen that somewhere else. Where the, the means of God's wrath becomes the means of his salvation. Behold then, both the kindness and the severity of God, Paul says. Look to Jesus, who took the means of God's wrath, death, and made it the means of our salvation the means of forgiveness. He took the means of God's wrath, a grave, and he made it a means of resurrection. If I'm faced, if I'm faced with dealing with what's behind me, my sins, my past, that invincible army of the law condemning me for all of my sins, and I see Jesus, who offers me the means of salvation through the means of wrath. I got one choice. I'm walking straight through in faith to believe in Jesus and to trust in him. Oh, well, this is all written down for our benefit so that we believe. Observe these things and know that the Lord is using difficult situations in all of our lives. Pray with me.